Good morning, everybody. If you'll allow me to put my glasses on so I can read what's in front of me so I don't stray too far and take 20 minutes. Um, as Steve said, uh, my name is Tom Nork, and I am the proud father of three beautiful daughters, 121, 118, who happens to be on the piano today, and 115. I'm best known as Janice's husband and my daughter's father. I am the head paper boy at the Sun Sentinel where I run the manufacturing and distribution side of the business. You know, in, in some respects, you've already heard my testimony in the song that we just sung, um, Through the Storm, He is Lord, Lord of All. And I, I count that a, a, a blessing to me. So I was born and raised in a Catholic home. I was an altar boy, and my grandfather wanted nothing more than for me to be a priest. Growing, you can laugh, I understand. Um, growing up, I was always searching for meaning and purpose in my life through sports and through relationships, but I never found it. I would leave church feeling great, but it wore off very quick. I felt like a balloon was blown up by the priest every Sunday and deflated by the time Monday was over. I don't know if you ever feel that way. By the time I was in college, I was not the young man that any one of you would approve your daughters being around. If one of my daughters introduced the 20-year-old Tom Nork to me today as the young man that they were interested in, I'd tell them to run the other way, fast. You know, I have a blessing of working with the youth. And there's, there's a blessing that you all have. The youth are scattered, but most of you are over there. There's a blessing that you all have that I, that I didn't have. You're growing up in a Christian Bible-believing church. Take advantage of it. You won't make some of the mistakes I made. Okay, fast forward a little bit. Sorry, Pastor, I digress. It was about this time that my sister came home from college. She was no longer the big party girl at FSU, but she was what I thought was a crazy Jesus freak. We were in my mom's driveway sitting on the back of her car, and my sister told me about this Jesus that was in her life. I thought she was crazy, but I realized I was a sinner and needed this Jesus she knew. I asked Jesus to forgive and save me that day, but in the weeks and months to follow, I didn't plug in to a Bible-believing church. So not much really changed in my life. I continued doing the things that I always did, all the wrong things. But now, and you may feel this sometimes, I knew it was wrong, but I had no godly influence to help me. Several years went by, I started a career, married a beautiful woman named Janice, but I still had no clue what was going on, but God found mercy on me by giving me Janice. I, like I said, I had no meaningful leadership in my life to help me be a husband or to manage this career or finances that the Lord was giving me. Time goes forward, Janice and I end up at a worship service on a Sunday when we were out of town in Atlanta on a business function, at a business function. Once again, I find myself in the front of a crazy Jesus freak. And he talked about the same Jesus that my sister did. It was on that day that I gave my life. I gave my marriage, I gave my career, I gave my family, and I gave my finances to the Lord. And I started my life with Jesus as a true part of it. Well, we came back to South Florida and found a strong Bible-believing church. I found, I found that meaning and purpose I was looking for and it was through the will of God. I still had, however, no, no real clue. Um, you, you see a theme here, I'm clueless. Um, no real clue as to what to do with this family, the money that the Lord is giving me. You may not either, sitting here. We plugged into this church, with another theme, his people, the Lord's people, and started reading God's word. You know, there's a lot of good stuff in that book, the Bible. 
day by day, week by week, month by month. The Lord taught me how to raise three girls, Janice and I, how to raise three girls. And today we have three amazing young ladies, and I have a wonderful, beautiful, godly wife. They are not perfect, and I am much less perfect than they are. We still have issues to work through, but we do it with the guidance of the Lord and his word. You know, God also taught me that my career in money is not mine either. We started tithing about the same time when we went to this church. And one day, Janice and I were sitting around the table. You all may do this as well, doing bills. And we are trying to figure out why the money wasn't working out. And Janice asked me a simple question. She said, are you tithing? My answer was, eh, no. Well, the Lord smacked me upside the face, and we've at minimum tithed since that day. You know, it's funny how the Lord can make his 90% go much farther than our 100%. Tithing did not stop financial problems, however. I still have a roof leak in my roof that's going to be repaired, and that costs money. I just replaced an air conditioner, and the second one needs to be replaced. We just found that out Christmas Eve. All while I've got two kids going to college at the same time. Tithing didn't stop the financial problems. But what it did is it gave all of our finances to the Lord, and I don't lose sleep over it because I know the Lord has it all under control. You know, I heard Pastor Eddie make the following statement a couple times, and it goes something like this. The Lord is seldom early, but he is never late. And I found this to be very true, not only in my finances, but every other part of my life as well. You know, this Jesus that we celebrated at Christmas has given me a wife, a family, a home, a career, and a joy that I strive to glorify him with every day. You can have this same joy that I have as well. Jesus is the reason for the season. The answer to your career, your finances, your family, and marriage, no matter what level of relationship you're at with him, whether you're a youth and still trying to figure it out, hoping not to make the mistakes, whether you're an adult and you've made the mistakes. Will you come back to Jesus, or will you come to Jesus today? Thank you, Tom. It's great how God transforms our lives. He meets us where we are. He causes our paths to cross. You know, he had that interaction with his sister at a certain point in his life, and then later in his adult life, he had the interaction in Atlanta where God really solidified the, his work and his heart and his life. And so at that point, there was a new dad and a new husband in the mix as God was transforming him. And Tom would be the first to tell you, as, as I would and any of us who know the Lord, that, that God's not finished with us yet. There's a continuing transformation that has to take place in our lives as we are obedient to him and and live under his control and his authority. Well, I hope you had a great Christmas. Um, we certainly did. We had the rare privilege of having all of our children home. Uh, we, have, we have had three in college. We're down to two. One graduated in December. Um, so we're down to two in college right now, and one, one still at home. The one that graduated has come back home. That's a good thing, though. She's not staying. Um, she's, she's, she's come back home with some job offers and also... Um, there's this guy that's about to marry her in March, so, um, so she's, she's preparing for that new transition in her life as well. But it's been great to have um, everyone at home. Uh, it was funny, we took, a, we took a, a, a ride somewhere to the restaurant or something recently in, in our van, and we have the same car that we had all through their high school time, and it was the funniest thing. Number one, they're bigger now, so... They fill up the van more than they used to, and it was just so funny to ride in the car with basically six adults, you know, as, as opposed to these little kids that we were used to taking trips with. So it's fun to be uh, at home with them, and of course everything's changing, but it's, a, it's an exciting time, and I know that some of you are experiencing that same thing. And we have guests with us here today who are visiting from out of town. I've met some of you already. We're so glad you're here. I know you're here visiting family, or maybe you're just home for college, two of the Two of the girls on stage today, the guitar player here, and you've already heard the, the pianist there, they're both away at school but are home for the holidays, so we were blessed to have them playing today and singing. Um, 
we're glad all of you're here. For those people who are from out of town visiting family, you're always welcome here. So when you come to South Florida, please count this as your church home, and, and we'd love to see you again and again. We're going to be looking in Luke chapter 2 today, so if you have your Bibles, please find Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. <clears throat> now, the story of the birth of Jesus, we have just looked at and, and, and just studied. We read through that on, on Christmas Eve, if you were here. But now we want to look at what happens immediately following the birth of Jesus, uh, beginning here in verse 21. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, this is what Simeon said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, that's what I'm calling today's message, salvation. It's really what the name Jesus means, um, and it's what Simeon has, has said here, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. This is, of course, him prophesying and, and recognizing that because of the future death of Christ, Mary, his mother, would grieve greatly and be in great sorrow as she watched her son die, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. I ask God that you would enlighten us and encourage us. I pray for anyone who is here that does not know you, as we've already prayed, Lord, that you would just open their eyes, help them to see from their hearts, from their minds, in their life, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. I pray for those of us who do know you, Lord, encourage us and help us to apply the truths of this passage to our lives and to the direction you have for us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, I want to sort of paint the picture of several things that, that we see in this passage on salvation, the understanding of salvation. There's kind of a high watermark that we're going to look at in the midst of the message, but all of the, the points that I'm going to try to draw out I think are critical and significant to our understanding of what it means to be right with God, what it means to live our lives under the authority and the leadership of Jesus. Number one, Jesus brings consolation. We see it there in verse 25, where Simeon says that they are... They have been waiting for the consolation of Israel. And he acknowledges Jesus, this new baby, who at this point would have been um, less than, than two months old. The, the eight-day circumcision, he would have come back to the temple around 40 days after the time of purification. So it's during that time frame that he has now come back to the temple with his parents uh, to, to receive this blessing and for them to make sacrifice uh, on his behalf and on their behalf. So... Um, the consolation of Israel is a picture of, of understanding that the days in which they lived were, were difficult. Uh, these days were broken days. They lived under the tyrannical leadership of Rome. They sort of lived under the thumb of Rome. And so they, they did not have freedom in the sense that they as Jews believed they should have freedom. And so they were looking for this one who would, who would bring 
who would console them in their grief and anguish and, and frustration. Now, most of them missed the idea of the Messiah, but many of them received the truth of Messiah, and certainly Simeon and Anna did. Simeon and Anna got it. They knew who this was that they were looking at and, and talking to. The children of God basically lived in agony, always looking for their Messiah. And what Jesus did is he brought hope, he brought a future, he brought forgiveness, and ultimately he brought salvation into the mix. Secondly, we see that Jesus brings revelation. Jesus brings revelation. Down in verse 32, part of Simeon's sharing with them, he says, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Now, this is really good news for me and, and for most of you because I'm a Gentile. Most of you are Gentiles as well. There are a few in our midst who are Jewish, but, but most of us are Gentiles. And so, there is a, a great sense of awe and wonder that the God of the universe who created us created a way for the Gentiles, those who were considered unclean and disconnected from God, to come to know the truth about God. It's critical that we, we see that picture, that there was this broadening of his salvation. I mean, from the very beginning, God intended that all would come to know him, but there is a, there is a picture of, of, of the idea of the chosen people of Israel being set aside specially for his causes and his purposes. And then now, as we see the coming of the, the salvation of the world through Christ uh, on the cross, ultimately paying that ultimate price for us, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. The salvation of the Gentiles was, was part of God's plan. And, and this process of, of salvation, of broadening, is, is why we today go to places to proclaim the good news about Jesus. Uh, this year, this coming year, we will spend time in Haiti, and we will spend time in France. Those are definite places that we will go. There's also, I believe, a, a trip planned for Guatemala. So we have these places where we are going to proclaim the truth of God, because in those places, there are people who do not yet know Jesus. There are also some people in those places, especially in France, because in France, we're primarily working among Muslim people who are from northern Africa who maybe have not even heard of Jesus, or if they have, it's only been in a negative way. And so we have this incredible opportunity to go to the world and share with them the hope that is in Christ. Now, to some extent, we're called to do that no matter where we are. All of us, in a sense, are missionaries. We, we have this opportunity to speak to our neighbors, to speak to co-workers and family members who don't yet know him. But there are still whole groups of people who have not even heard of Jesus. In fact, it's in the thousands, not the dozens. And that seems unfathomable to us who live in America because it seems so easy. I mean, you can turn on the television, you can go to the internet, you can listen to the radio. I mean, there are multiple Christian stations here, and we're not even in the Bible Belt in South Florida. Imagine up in the Bible Belt how many Christian stations there are. And there are churches all over the place proclaiming the truth of Jesus. It, it seems incredibly difficult for us to understand that there would be people anywhere on the planet that had not heard of Jesus, but there are. There clearly are. There are Bibles not translated yet into languages of people, and uh, there are still so many needs, and the populations continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. So we have this call to go and proclaim, and, and it all began here. It all began as Jesus, this light of revelation, began to cast his light on those who, who needed him most. Now, if there is a high watermark in this message, and, and if I could say this is the most important thing, if you, if you only walk away with one thing, walk away with this, it would be my third point here today, and that is that Jesus brings glory. Jesus brings glory. Simeon also says that just after a light for revelation to the Gentiles, he says, and for glory to your people Israel. Jesus brings glory. God's glory is always the purpose behind the purpose. Nothing trumps God's glory. Though other wonderful purposes are fulfilled, nothing trumps God's glory. It's hard for us to grasp that. It's easy for me to say it. It's a little harder for us to understand it because we are prone by our human nature to even bring a sense of selfishness into our worship. You know, if 
we, we want the music to be a certain way. Why? Because we like it that way. We want the preaching to be a certain way. Why? Because we like it that way. We, we, we want the atmosphere to be a certain way because that's the way it ought to be. Says who? Well, says me. Because it's all about me. So we visit churches and we look for certain things. So we, even in our worship, we bring in our selfishness sometimes. We want the benefits of God without necessarily clinging to the benefactor who is God himself. We miss his glory, but his glory trumps everything. Now this, this will be a little bit hard to swallow, but I, I want to be so bold as to say the following. I've done a lot of funerals in my ministry, and very often I hear something at a funeral like, I'm so glad that John or Jane knew Jesus as Lord because I know that we will be reunited in the future. I don't think that's false if, in fact, they knew the Lord and they go to heaven and, and you know the Lord and you go to heaven. Yeah, in a sense, you will be reunited in heaven. But, you know, being reunited with lost loved ones is not the goal of heaven. That's nothing compared to being in the very literal presence of God. I don't think we're going to walk in through the gates of heaven and say, Where, where's my husband? Where's my, where's my wife? Where are my children? Where, I, I just want to see them again. I, where are my grandchildren? But we sometimes, because we're from the bottom looking up, we think that that's going to be the peak. We'll all be back together. Oh, no, no, no. Make no mistake. We're going to walk in and we're going to say, Wow! God is here. Well, yeah, it's heaven. Of course God's here. We're not going to be thinking about those lost loved ones. I, I just... I just can't see that anywhere in Scripture. There's not a verse that says, and, and when you get to heaven, you get to hang out with your children and grandchildren all you want to. It says a lot about us worshiping God for all of eternity. It says a lot about the glory of God being evident and thick and real because that's the position we'll be in for the rest of our lives. So I don't know exactly what all that means, but I do know that God's glory is top. God's glory is top. So as we go through our lives, our obedience to God brings about His glory. So here's what happens. If I'm living for the glory of God, there are some incredible byproducts. And the, the best way to describe the byproduct of God's glory is the single word, joy. God gives joy. So I'm living in obedience, not out of selfishness and not out of wanting to do what I want. And as I'm living in this obedience, God gives me a sense of satisfaction, a sense of joy, a sense of real happiness, true happiness, because I'm following after God. And I'm able to follow after God because he's come in and taken residence in my life. And so his glory shines through me. And sometimes his glory shines through healing someone. Sometimes his glory shines through saving that marriage. Sometimes his glory shines through these really positive things. Sometimes his glory shines at the time of loss, at the time of dysfunction. Because when we cling to the Lord, even in those times, others see, wow, they really believe. They really have the glory of God in them because of God's presence. And so our connection to God and our interaction with God is all for His glory. That's the picture that we see. And, and when we have that relationship and that connection, then, then all other things pale in significance. Now, now, don't get me wrong. People are a gift from the Lord. You just heard me say how awesome it's been to have our children home for Christmas. I love our kids. I, I'm glad we had them, usually. I, I, I like hanging out with them. I see so much of me in them, and, and vice versa, I'm sure. But I, I, just, I just want us to understand that as wonderful as that can be, it's nothing compared to the glory of God. Nothing. And as terrible as a situation may be in our life, whatever a bad situation may be happening, that badness is not nearly as powerful over time as the glory of God. God's glory. Our church was young, um, some of you know this story, but we, uh, we really felt led of God that we were to purchase the property on which you're seated right now. 
and it didn't make any sense. We had some really smart people on our leadership team. They all were in business, and, and they were really smart with, with numbers and with money and, and with forecasting, and they could make spreadsheets for their spreadsheets. And every single one of them looked at our finances and looked at our situation and looked at our size, and they said, you know, it makes absolutely no sense for us to buy this almost million-dollar piece of property at the time, but we think we're supposed to. Every single one of them said that, independently of the others. And I felt that way, and I said, I think you're right. I think we're supposed to do it. I don't know how, but we're, we're going to trust God and go ahead. We brought that to the church. We were very honest with the church. We said it makes no sense for us to do this. No business person would encourage us to do this. No financially-minded person would say, this would be wise. No one. But we think we're supposed to, and our church said, we agree. Wow, okay. Then we're going to do it. So we, we worked it out. We had just enough in the bank to deal with closing costs and issues like that. God miraculously worked out financing for us to be able to do this because that didn't make sense either, but, but God worked it out. And, and over a series of months, finally it was all done. It, it took several months for it to be completely finished. It was completely finished. We had the property, and we were starting to pay the mortgage on a piece of dirt. No building. We were still meeting at the high school. All of us were saying we have to build because we can't have a piece of land without a building on it and but yet the smart financial people were saying yes but we have no money to build so that's not going to work right now we need to pray that God shows us what to do next and things were tight about six months in we realized oh my goodness we can't even pay the bills we have we, we had a storefront office which we closed we had some other things which we set aside I was the only paid staff member at the time so for the most part at least in a full-time capacity and so I was like oh I really hope that the offerings keep coming because I'd like to eat um as you can tell, I haven't missed, so we're good. Um, <laughs> but we, we kept pushing on that, and we would come to our people. I think three or four times in a two-year period, we came to the church, and we said, look, we don't have enough money. Here's where we are. Here's where we need to be. Please give. We would set goals of giving, and, and every time, every single time, the church exceeded the goal. But this one time we were praying, and it was a, it was a big number that we were off, and we thought, you know, we can't, I don't think they can give that. They're already giving sacrificially. And about that time, I got a phone call from a guy that I didn't know, but he said he'd come to our church for three weeks. He said, I'd like to take you out to lunch. I said, okay, great. So he took me out to lunch, and when I got to lunch, I found out the guy was, we were exactly the same age. I think I was 29 or 30 at the time. And um, we're sitting there, and, and he's talking about our church and how glad they are to be coming to our church. And, and, and um, I mean, literally halfway through the lunch, I forgot his name. That's how much I didn't know this guy. And he said, and so, Pastor, I'd, I'd like to give the church a gift if that would be all right. I said, sure, you know, and be glad, it'd be great. Sometimes people do that. I don't know why they feel they need to hand it to me, but they, they do that sometimes because I, I really don't handle the money or, or deal with the money or anything. And he slid a $100,000 check across the table at the restaurant. Uh, two things hit my mind immediately. How in the world could someone my age have $100,000 to share? <laughs> I just don't get that. And the second thing that hit me was, I'm not sure this check is real. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Both of those things hit my mind almost simultaneously. And um, I remembered his name at that point, though. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, I was blown away. But I was still kind of nervous. I, I called my wife uh, and told her what had happened. And, and I think we had just gotten cell phones. You know, it was brand new. I was like, guess what? You know, guess what? <laughs> We just got this check. And she said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to the bank because I don't know if it's real or not. You know? and so I go to the bank. I had never been to the bank for our church because I didn't deal with that stuff. I walked into the bank. I introduced myself. I didn't know where our account was. I didn't know the account number or anything like that. I told them who I was. told them the name of the church. She said, oh, yes, sir. She pulls it up. She goes, sure, we got you right here. I said, I'd like to make a deposit. She goes, okay. I slid across. She goes, wow, it's a generous donation that someone gave. I said, yeah. I said, um, um, I had kind of a weird question. She was like, yes. I said, I don't know if it's real. <laughs> she said, would you like me to do a check verification? I said, you can do that? She goes, yes. I said, that would be great. So she, again, kind of new to computers and all still, she walks over and picks up a telephone mounted to the wall, and she dialed it and, and called the other bank that it was drawn on to find out, and she said, the funds are there right now. I said, deposit it. Hurry. <laughs> Get it in there. 
So I didn't tell anyone except my wife. I didn't tell our leadership team. I didn't tell anyone because I wanted to check to clear. I said, how long will it take? She said, about three days. I said, okay. So that was like a Tuesday or Wednesday. Friday, I go back in the bank. I could have called, but, you know, I go back in the bank. I find my favorite teller, <laughs> and I, I said, did it clear? She pulls it up. She goes, it's in the bank. It's in the account. I said, wow, it's amazing. Thank you very much. And on church, at church on Sunday, I announced it for everyone to hear. The guys who were serving, and one lady serving on our leadership team, all their mouths dropped simultaneously. There were only like 100 of us, so I could see them. You know, they're all right there. And they all went, just like that. And it was one of those things where Tom said that, that one of the things I say often, and I do, is that God is seldom early and never late. That year, God was early, because that was March. And we were, our, our financial year was January through December, and we did the math and figured that we would have been exactly $100,000 short that year had that special gift not come in. Unsolicited, it just came. That guy came to our church for another couple of weeks. I never saw him again. And you know what's weird? I don't remember his name now. God's glory. Because when that happened, all we could do at the end of that year was look back and say, wow, look what God did. Look what God did. So understand that, that God's glory exceeds anything else that we would think or desire or want. Another thing is that Jesus brings truth. Jesus brings truth. The, the paragraph, he, he finishes sort of that initial talking in verses 29 to 32. And, and in verse 33, it says, And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him by Simeon. And then Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, the mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, not a sign that will be received, and not, not that people will be glad to hear him and, and know about him, but a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. I believe what he's talking about there is that when the truth of God comes by way of Jesus, it will be a dividing line among people. So the truth brings freedom. The Bible says that. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth brings clarity so that we understand the direction God wants. But make no mistake, the truth divides. The truth shows who believes that Jesus is the way and who does not believe that Jesus is the way. And someone's right and someone's wrong. There's no middle ground there. No middle ground. It's the, it's the people who believe that almost anything goes. Those, those are the most confused people, because that would mean Jesus is a liar. Jesus says, I'm the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's either true or it's false. You can't disbelieve that and still say that Jesus is a good guy, because what you're saying is that liar is a good guy. No, he's a liar. But if you believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, as I do, as our church does, as this book teaches then you recognize that the truth necessarily divides. It doesn't mean that we have to be divisive in the way we work with people and interact with people, but it does mean that we have to hold to that truth as the one way that makes us right with God. And so Jesus brings truth, which ultimately leads, for those of us who receive that truth, to our salvation. And then last, Jesus brings redemption. Jesus brings redemption redemption he says there at the very end Anna actually says at the very end waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem to redeem is is the idea of of being bought back when you take your coupons to the grocery store or or wherever you may take them you lay them in front of the cashier and he or she will will take that with the face value marked on it either a percentage or a dollar amount marked on it and they will, in essence, buy that from you, thus giving you a credit on the item that you're purchasing. So they are, in essence, buying that piece of paper back. That's exactly what Jesus has done for us. He has redeemed us. He has bought us back. See, God's original intent was that, that we would have perfect connection, interaction, communion with him. He had that with Adam and Eve prior to their fall in sin. 
And he, he walked with them in the garden. He talked with them in the garden. And the, and the process of life since this time of sin, since the selfishness and the sinfulness that set in through Adam and Eve, was humanity's attempt to get back right with God. And so they would, they would plead for certain things, and, and God would grant those things, but he would grant those things as a way to show them that they cannot meet the standard. None of us can. So first it was the law. Follow the law perfectly and you can be right with God. Sounds good, doesn't work. Why? Because no one can follow it perfectly. It requires perfection to follow the law. Um, we have the judges, we have the kings, we have the prophets, we have all these different ones coming along all the time. They follow this person, follow, and it seems like it would work, but it doesn't. It doesn't. What do we need? We need a Savior. We need someone else to pay the price because we can't pay the price. It's impossible. It's impossible for man to please God. So what must happen? What happened on the cross? It was there that we gained the possibility to be redeemed. It was there that the price was paid for our redemption to be put right with God. God credited it toward our account of indebtedness. And, and so sin breaks our relationship with God, but the cross redeems us and pays, and reconnects our relationship. Isaiah 59.2 says that your sins have cut you off from God. One translation says your sins have put a wall between you and God. And so it, 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 there's this division. None of us can be right with God apart from Jesus. So Jesus brings redemption. But it all goes back to the glory of God. We, we come to this place recognizing the glory. Uh, I still hear people say, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, I believe, I still hear people talking about God's love toward us. Almost the idea that, isn't it great that God loves me? It, you know, I, I, I'm, and, and even if they don't say the words, it almost comes across like I am worthy to receive God's love. You know, I was created in His image, we're different from all the rest of creation, and so, you know, God, God just loves us. He thinks we're all that. He thinks we're great. Nope. We don't deserve his love. We deserve his punishment. We deserve his judgment. We deserve damnation. The amazing thing is he loves us anyway. That's what's amazing. Not that we're lovable. We're not. We're sinners. The fact that God would love anyone is the miracle. Not that he might not love everyone. Some people go, well, I don't believe it. Does God love this person? Does love that? No, no, there's a bigger question before we get into the jots and tittles and arguing about all of this. That God loves anyone is a miracle beyond all miracles. And the reason we struggle with that is because we're selfish by nature. And we assume that God will love me. Well, surely God will love me. I'm a pretty good guy. I'm, I try to take care of my family. I try to do what's right. You know, I'm not perfect. You know, nobody's perfect, but I'm pretty good. Compared to, and you give a list of scoundrels to make you feel better. There are other lists I could give you that might make you feel worse. It's not about our goodness. It's about God's grace. It's about the gift of life that God gives. When we understand who we are in relationship to God, it changes how we view grace. And we, we receive it as, as an, the amazing gift that it is. Recently, we were out of town. Our, our eldest graduated from college um, in Birmingham, Alabama. So we were there for kind of a long weekend for that graduation just a few weeks ago. And um, we have a new puppy in our home. I don't know what we were thinking, but... So we have a 10-year-old dog who's sweet and gentle and small and easy, and she just kind of almost takes care of herself. But we wanted a big dog. So we got this puppy that will be one day a big dog. She's not big yet. Her name's Ladybird. And Ladybird is a hunting dog. She will be 60 or 70 pounds. Right now she's 20 or 30 pounds, but... She's crazy. <laughs> She's absolutely certifiable. She buzzes around our house. She chews anything that comes within 17 inches of her mouth, including your hand, your shoe while it's on your foot, anything, anything. She's crazy. 
So we went to see our good friends. I, well, they were our good friends. I don't know if they still are, but our, our friends, the Browns, Daryl and Michelle. And we said, hey, would you be willing? Oh, we'd love to take care of Lady Bird. She's so cute. I was like, yeah, she's crazy. Um, well, they have a big dog. They have this dog that is this big and this big. It's like a lion. It's a huge dog, a golden doodle, I believe. It's massive, big dog. So I take Ladybird over to their house to meet Theo, which is short for Theophilus. That's their dog. Ladybird and Theo are meeting for the first time, and I walk up with her on a leash. And the minute Theo comes around the corner in their family room, Ladybird hit the deck, all fours out, head on the ground. And she's going, <laughs> total submission. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. I thought, wow. And so Theo comes lumbering over, you know, to sniff on her. And she's like, oh, oh, oh. I mean, he's huge. You know, he looks like this monster of a dog. And so they began to test the waters and get to know each other. But, you know, in, in a real sense, in a real sense, our coming into the presence of God is just like that. No, I don't think Theo is God. And Lady Bird is us. But there is that picture of our total submission to a holy God. And, and is that really how we live? Or do we somehow not live that way? Because we think we got it all figured out. You know, I read the Bible. I kind of know what I'm supposed to do. I'm good. I've been doing the church thing for a long time. So I know how, to, I know how I'm supposed to live, etc. No, no, no. He is God. Well, fast forward, we're gone for the weekend, and we're nervous. We're texting them every, you know, a couple times a day. Is everything okay? Is everything all right? Everything's great. They're, they're, they're a very flexible family. They're very wonderful. And so Billy, our, our youngest, and we say that this is Billy's dog. We really got this dog for Billy. Billy goes back to get his dog, and he described to me what he saw when he went in. Theo was laying on the, the tile, big beast of a dog, Theo. And Ladybird was laying over him, just like that. And I thought, well, I guess they became friends over time. It's very much like that with the Lord as well. While we are completely submissive to him because he is God, what's really amazing is that he wraps his arms around us and he draws us into a relationship with him so that in a real sense, we become the friend of God. It's amazing absolutely amazing that God would do that. So I don't know where you stand today with the Lord, but I, I want you to know that Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. Salvation is 100% an act of God. He does the saving. By His grace and His grace alone, through our faith alone, God steps into our lives and, and gives us declares us to be righteous. We, we can't become righteous on our own. He just declares it as so because of the cross, because there everything was paid for. And so I invite you to the cross today if you do not know him. And um, if you do know him, I invite you to grow richly and deeply in your understanding of him, knowing that his glory brings about the greatest good in all of our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, I do thank you for your grace and your glory. It's on that grace and glory that we stand. We cannot stand on our own feet, in our own power, in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own knowledge. We can't be good enough, Lord. We can't follow the rules enough. It's impossible. There is no one righteous, not one, but God being rich in mercy. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We praise you for that. We thank you for that. So again, I, I do pray for anyone who's here that does not know you as Lord and Savior. Reveal the truth to them. Draw them to yourself by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit and by the authority of your grace and your glory in their lives. Do what only you can do, Lord. And then, Lord, I, I pray for those of us who do know you, that you would remind us of who we are in you. Teach us to live in obedience. Teach us to understand your glory at a, at a deeper level, at a higher level, at a more meaningful level, lest we get caught up in the in the fickle things that happen in our day-to-day -day lives and, and miss the fact that you are overall, you are sovereign. You are Lord of Lords, King of Kings. We can trust you with every detail. 
Thank you, Lord, for, for being there in that way for us. Teach us what it means to live that way every day of our lives. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please? I want to invite you to come as we sing together. If, if there is um, a, a prayer need that you have or just something you'd like to lay before the Lord, even in your life or, or in the life of someone else that you're concerned about or, or praying for, I would invite you to come and just kneel and, and lift that concern to the Lord and ask Him to do what only He can do. I'll be standing here if you have spiritual questions, if you'd like to talk more about this relationship and being connected to God and, and what it means to understand His grace and His glory, I would love to talk with you more about that. I don't have all the answers, but this book does, and I can point you to some great places in it to, to give you direction by His Spirit that, that we all need. So as we sing together, you come as the Spirit of God leads. to your side so heaven is real and death is a lie I want to hear voices with angels above singing as one hallelujah holy holy God
I got nothing else to say. <laughs> Have a great week.